Greetings and welcome back to room 303 and our ongoing lectures with the Harvard Classics. We now turn to volume 3 and we're going to talk for a few moments now in just kind of set up about who we will look at here. We leave the Greeks in volume 2 and the Romans uh, with Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius and of course our Plato study and we now turn to British or English prose stylists. We're going to look at first Francis Bacon in this lecture and then we'll study a couple of essays by the great John Milton and then finally Thomas Brown. Um, now I, I'd like you to put in your notes right away this observation and one of the reasons that will serve as kind of a motivation for our study. Um, we can only write good prose if we learn to read good prose and underline the word learn to read good prose. We have to be able to appreciate and respect good prose in our reading before we will begin to really respect the good prose that we will hopefully create in our writing. We're going to now turn to Francis Bacon and uh, the, the, the decision in the third volume to, uh, of, the, of the creators of the Harvard Classics um, uh, many years ago uh, to, to include Francis Bacon quite early on I think sends a powerful message to us about the, the importance of learning to write well through reading well. Um, we're going to look at Francis Bacon's essays and his uh, New Atlantis, but I also wanted to make some general observations about Bacon because he's such an important theorist for us and thinker for us and writer for us. Let's enjoy studying texts that challenge us. I think that's again one of those observations of why you need to be studying the text in the Harvard Classics and of course other kinds of you know great book series uh, that, that are going to challenge us with really complicated texts. Let's also appreciate at the end of our conversation the ways in which somebody like Francis Bacon influenced the 20th and now the 21st century. Um, we'll begin of course with this question who was Francis Bacon? Fascinating guy. Let's work through his life and talk a little bit about major texts um, and then outline the one text that we will have here in our volume called the New Atlantis and then we'll finish some observations with a few of his essays. There's so many of them we obviously can't do all of them justice. I fell in love with Francis Bacon through my study with Will Durant and his great story of philosophy. If you're looking for a title that can really challenge you. I recommend this little 1926 volume. It's almost now 100 years old. It's amazing to think. Will Durant's Story of Philosophy. And he gives a chapter to Francis Bacon that I really recommend. It's such beautiful prose. His 11 volume Durant's 11 volume set, The Story of Civilization, I also recommend to you as well. Nobody talks about Durant anymore uh, today as much as they used to, but he was really a gifted pro stylist. I think he's one of the finest pro stylists in English that I've ever read and I recommend him to you. Let's take a few notes now on biography stuff of, of Bacon and obviously as we've said in other lectures you can do your own kind of research if you need to find out more information about about Bacon. Born in 1561, uh, think about that one, that date as you have it on your timeline, right? 40 years before Hamlet in 1600, think about Shakespeare's Hamlet, right? Uh, has a brilliant father, brilliant mother, and she actually is the one who really did kind of tutor and train the young Francis. She taught him and uh, we're thankful, we're very thankful for it. Uh, during his life, we're going to say several things about his life, but let's point it out this way. The Renaissance during Francis Bacon's life, the Renaissance will move from Italy and Spain to England. And of course, it makes sense. We just mentioned Shakespeare's Hamlet, so obviously we've mentioned Shakespeare. I've already said that we're going to we're going to uh, deal with uh, uh, John Milton here in a, in a few uh, in, in the next uh, lecture. Um, and let's remind ourselves that with the defeat of Spain and the Spanish Armada in 1588, we are going to see the Renaissance then move from Spain, Italy to. England and what a flowering we have during this Elizabethan time and then uh, and then right after Queen Elizabeth the importance of uh, James the uh, first we think about the importance of James the first with our 1611 year and the King James version of the Bible just think about that amazing time in 1600 you have Hamlet in 1611 you have the King James version of the Bible quite remarkable 
at 12, uh, just to now move quickly through a biography, at 12, Bacon is accepted to uh, Trinity College in Cambridge. Um, here, he, among other things, he learns to become disgruntled with Aristotle and the deductive method. He will uh, tr uh, become attracted to more the inductive method. We'll have more to say about this in a bit. Um, and the scientific method will become the language that he will want to speak. Of course, we're all familiar with this. Let's just outline it quickly for our notes. That three-part dance of the scientific method, the forming of some kind of a hypothesis, of course, the testing and collecting of data for that hypothesis to validate or invalidate, and then finally, the capacity to generalize and replicate study and, of course, share. At 16, think about this, because obviously this is where we are in, in, in age range. At 16, Bacon becomes ambassador to France. He enters politics, we should point out reluctantly. He feels and he says that he has a duty to his country. At 18, this is an important moment, his father dies. Leaving him poor, he will turn to the law. And by 22, just a few years later, he's entered Parliament because of his capacities as a great speaker. So let's just say it now. Bacon is what we will call a polymath. Okay, that is to say, he has tremendous abilities in all kinds of areas. I mean, if you look this cat up on, uh, you know, online or whatever, he's going to be called different things. A scientist, a philosopher, a politician, a lawyer. I mean, there's just all this stuff that he did. Uh, by 57, at the age of 57, he becomes Lord Chancellor, one of the most powerful positions in all of England. So it's a remarkable story. Now, when we look at his works, we'll talk about a few of these uh, just for review. The first one we'll talk about is Advancement of Learning. He writes this from 1603 to 05. And in this, in, in, in this essay, he, he argues that science is the road to utopia, to, so, to social, sh social perfection. Um, science, however, is not enough, he will argue. You need a method and a purpose. That is to say, there's got to be specialists and those specialists are going to share their findings internationally. And of course, this will begin then for us to think more about the role of universities and the idea that is way ahead of his time, that universities and the ones doing the scientific research should cooperate together and publish and share information. Um, he, he will point out that the concept of the conquest of nature by humans and, of course, this idea, famous, famous to, a uh, quote, famous to Bacon, although technically you can't find this in his writings, knowledge is uh, power, um, attributed to Bacon. There is one uh, um, Latin phrase that can be kind of translated that way, and that's why it's attributed to him. The second text we'll talk about very quickly is his new organon, or new method, the old organon, or method, was Aristotle. He writes this one from 1608 to 1620. And this is often considered his greatest work. Uh, it's an amazing work of logic. It's difficult study, but it's worth your, it's worth your time if you want to give some energies to it. Um, the Greeks and Aristotle, he said, um, spent too much time with theory and not enough time with observation. This is what we will often mean when we say that Bacon will emphasize the inductive method as opposed to the deductive method. He will argue that there has to be this destruction of the idols of the mind. We'll go through them quickly just so you have them in your notes. The idols of the tribe, fallacies or mistakes that are natural to all of humanity. Secondly, idols of the cave, those are individual mistakes and errors of judgment. Three, idols of the marketplace, obviously the problems with economics. And finally, idols of the theater. These are the fallacies or the screw-ups by especially philosophers. And here, he will argue for the need for methodotic doubt. That is to say, our fallibilist position in an earlier lecture, we talked about the epistemological model of the fallibilist position, the absolutist position on one, on one hand, I am right and everybody else is wrong. The exact opposite, the relativist position, there is no truth, but the problem with saying there is no truth is that you seem to be positing a truth. Somewhere in the middle is the fallibilist position, and this is really what Bacon was talking about when he talked about a methodotic doubt. In other words, there has to be some sense that I could be wrong. And this is his challenge in regards to induction versus deduction. 
uh, deduction is to begin with an idea and then go out and find data to validate or invalidate that idea. Induction is to simply begin the process of looking at a potential um, host of data or whatever and then beginning to draw ideas or assumptions from that collection of data without some kind of prearranged a, a priori idea. And for uh, for Bacon, this use of the induction model is so much more important than anything Aristotle proposed. Now, there's a huge debate about, well, when did this induction idea start? Well, technically, of course, we always use it, and of course, Socrates was playing the game. But the, dif the distinction that's often made is that Socrates was involved primarily in the analysis of language and ideas, and, it la and he lacked a specific kind of method that certainly Bacon will, will suggest for us in many ways, and you can put it in your notes this way, and some people have said this, and I, and I tend to agree, in many ways for Bacon, the scientific method replaced the Platonic theory of the forms in our, in our two-box theory, that second idea. In other words, for Bacon, there were laws of nature. We immediately start to think about the Enlightenment, of course, that will be a byproduct of this, and especially we think of Newton, don't we, right? Um, in other words, the foundations, these laws of nature, uh, foundations of all theory and all practice. The other thing we want to put in your notes from New Organon that's critical is Bacon's idea that knowledge must generate achievement. It's not enough to just learn stuff. You got to be able to actually use this information to perfect what? Society. This is a critical argument of Bacon's. It doesn't matter what you know if it can't make the world a better place. Which leads us now to his text, New Atlantis, which is in volume three. This is just a fragment of a text, sadly. He wrote it two years before his death in 1624. It, it, it really is kind of a, 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 an amazing statement of what it would look like, society, if science was the thing driving everything instead of politics. Um, now, just for the title, in Plato's classic dialogue, the Timaeus, there is some mention already of Atlantis, this idea of a island that was perfect or a civilization that was perfect and then uh, destroyed it uh, it's often what we mean when we talk about a utopia all right the new atlantis the old atlantis by the way for bacon is considered usually the america columbus and cabot but the new atlantis will be this island in the pacific it's different from europe definitely a utopia. And let's go ahead at 3A and already make our observation here that Sir Thomas More had written his kind of version of utopia. And so you have some interesting ideas going back and forth uh, between these two. The story in many ways will begin kind of like a Defoe or a Swift text where he says, we were, the narrator says, we were out sailing in the ocean in the Pacific. We sailed from Peru, he says, and we hit what we sometimes refer to as the doldrums. The ship doesn't move. Everybody starts to starve and die of thirst. And at the very last second, they see this island. On this island, they're not savages. There's these, they're these amazing people. And very slowly, the mystery of the new Atlantis becomes clear. There's a conversation at the end of this that's going to be the heart of the text, where the narrator is told by an individual just what is going on. Um, first of all, he's told about the great lawgiver in uh, Solomona, and then the building or the construction of Solomon's house. Let's put that in our notes. That will be the heart of the New Atlantis text. It fundamentally takes the place of England's House of Parliament, the silly politics that Bacon himself was a part of and ultimately would bring him to the end of politics. It's a government, though, of scientists, a government without politicians. Think about that one. And governors here worry less about ruling people and they are more interested in controlling nature. In other words, again, knowledge is power. There's a famous quote out of the New Atlantis that I want to read for you that kind of in many ways is kind of the key sentence of the text and is also in many ways the key sentence to understanding the life's work of Bacon. It runs like this. The end of our foundation is the knowledge of causes and secret motions of things and the enlarging of the bounds of human empire to the affecting of all things possible." End quote. Now, what is it that goes on here? Uh, well, just 
very quickly. Uh, among other things, study stars, use water for power, develop gases to, for example, cure illnesses and sicknesses. They experiment on animals so that they can have surgical knowledge. Uh, growing different kinds of plants and animals through crossbreeding sometimes. They even have tried to formulate a way to fly like the birds. We think about Leonardo da Vinci, don't we? Um, they even have submarine crafts. And, importantly, we're told that this is a culture of peace. No wars are fought to create foreign markets, to go out and try to gain things. However, they have this fascinating paradigm where every 12 years, they send out these scouts, for lack of a better phrase, who kind of go out into the world, collect the most important information, not money, not stuff that can be bought and sold, but ideas. In other words, they're cultural researchers, and they go out, they learn new languages, they learn new things about the world, and they bring that information back to New Atlantis, and there it is shared with the people. They report their findings. Well, you can already kind of see that this is starting to look very much and trending very much towards the idea of what would a society look like that was very much driven by the quest for knowledge instead of the quest for stuff. Wow, it would look quite different from the Europe and the England, of course, of Bacon's day, and we might say today's day. Um, Bacon's dream might be a way for you to finish this, this idea up in your notes, is to replace the politician with the scientist. In other words, instead of trying to dominate other people and the worlds and other cultures, could we ever come to a point where we share and work together? For Bacon, it is a dream. Of course, it's one maybe worth our consideration. Now, Bacon's legacy, let's talk about that for a moment because I think it's really important that you understand we place this this thinker center foremost in so many ways at kind of the beginning of what we will later call modernity, the modern. 1662, for example, the Royal Society is formed and will name Bacon as their primary model. The French encyclopedists, Diderot and the rest of them, will dedicate their work to Bacon. We think of several great philosophers who have direct correspondence to the work of Bacon. We think of Hobbes and his materialism in his classic text, Leviathan. Again, some of these titles I will have more to say on later in further lectures. Obviously, I recommend that you would go and do a bit of research on your own. Or how about John Locke's empirical, empirical psychology? Um, that is to say, he relied primarily on observation instead of theology or metaphysics to try to understand the human mind. Bentham and Jeremy Bentham and his utilitarian project, which will culminate with the work of John Stuart Mill, a text uh, that I've already mentioned in an earlier lecture on liberty, all can kind of draw its intellectual antecedents from Francis Bacon and the work of Bacon, especially in the New Atlantis. Finally, let's point out that there's a certain kind of European, we will call it this, or European and Western and American optimism that is in many ways born during this time. Francis Bacon didn't invent this, obviously. We have Shakespeare and others to kind of be the kickstart as well. But no, we really do have an optimism here. And, uh, and here's a famous quote by Bacon that kind of gives you a sense of this optimism. And when we study our Emerson, we are always going to kind of come back to some idea like this. Quote, men are not animals erect, but immortal gods, end quote. In other words, everything is possible is the argument that he's making. Well, let's finish our biography with a comment about Bacon and the very end. In 1621, he's accused of taking a bribe, which probably was true. He ends up in the Tower of London for a couple of days. Ultimately, he's let out a couple of days later. Uh, the last five years of his life are lived out kind of like in type of poverty and solitude. He's living at home. He's continuing to kind of think about ideas um, in March of, of 1626, he, he's actually um, out on the road and he starts thinking about refrigeration. And he comes to this idea that, I wonder if we were to take a chicken and put it under the snow, I wonder what that would look like. So he starts stuffing a chicken with snow and he develops a cough and a few weeks later he's dead at 65 years of age. I, I've said in earlier lectures sometimes that in, in fun and games, you can play the game of chicken and eggs, that is, to, uh, eggs and bacon, um, and, and because he dies stuffing, stuffing a chicken with snow. One of the most brilliant men who ever lived 
minds that ever thought dyes uh, stuffing chickens. And yet the point we want to make here is Bacon dies doing the thing he loves, scientific inquiry, right? Let's now turn in the last part of our lecture to the essays of Bacon. And here we are going to be met with 59 remarkable individual works. The last one of the 59 is unfinished, sadly, but the topics are incredible. I mean, just to take a look, they range from of truth and of death to end with of anger and of fame. He usually begins his essays with this word of, which would be our word about, and then he's ready to make some observations. Let's, let's turn to a few of these and um, play some games really quickly with just a few of these. I, I, I wish I had time to go through a whole bunch of these. Uh, what I would recommend for you, if you really want to improve your writing, is to take each one of these 59, look at the title, read and annotate the essay, and then try and write your own essay of no more than 500 words on that topic. Try to, in other words, build or emulate from the work of Bacon. Let's take a look at a few of these essays in regards to uh, the way they're constructed. So we'll be working primarily at level 2 now, maybe a little bit of level 1, but primarily level 2 and especially 2B. For example, let's point out the first lines and the genius that he has with first lines. In For Example of Death, how about this line? Men fear death as children fear to go in the dark. And as the natural fear in children is increased with tales, so is the other. Tales here obviously meaning stories and mythologies and the like, scary stories and the like. How about this one? His opening line of his essay, of revenge. We're all familiar with that idea, right? Because of our Hamlet study even. Revenge is a kind of wild justice, which the more man's nature runs to, the more ought law to weed it out. In other words, be careful.